Welcome to Fuzzy Butts and Friends. I'm your host, Luke Robinson, your big dog. And unfortunately, my co-host, Ginger Morgan, the director of the Puppy Up Foundation, is not with us uh, this time around. She has what I just had. I, I tell you what, this is the second cold I've had this season. And on top of that, COVID. And uh, so I'm recovering. My pipes are are, are pretty good. Um, I have to stay hydrated. Uh, so I think they'll carry the hour. Um, we've got lots to talk about. Um, so it's a, a bad thing not to have Ginger Morgan here this time, but maybe maybe having her yap the entire hour, that's probably good. We, maybe that, that Ann and I can get some important work done here. So no, I, I'm just kidding. For those of you who listen to Fuzzy Butts and Friends, Ginger barely gets two sentences in this program. So um, I don't know why. Uh, maybe I should actually give her more lines. Uh, but uh, we wish her well and look forward to having her back here on Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Uh, speaking of friends, I'm glad to have on, on this episode, um, one of ours I met early on on our travels, it's Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. Hohenhaus. I'm sorry, did I get that right? You got it. Yep. Excellent. From uh, the Animal Medical Center and out of New York City, a place I absolutely love. Um, and, and, and remind me, we have met before. That, is that correct? We, we've met uh, at Veterinary Cancer Society, I think. Because uh, I think you and the dogs were there one year. Ginger's been there multiple times. And then you also, we also met when you came here to AMC one time. And I don't know what brought you to AMC, um, but I am darn certain that, that you were here uh, on 62nd Street. Yes, my, my apologies. I just sound, you may just made me sound horrible, which you should. I am. I have a, I'm terrible with names. I meet so many people. That's no excuse. I, I know we met. I remember that. I just couldn't, I was fairly certain it was AMC. Um, we've been there a number of times. We were there on a tour with Chick Weiss. Um, we funded a bladder cancer study there with uh, yep. Chick. And uh, so we probably, probably met there. But I tell you what, we, even if we did meet, I certainly didn't know you're all the great, interesting, wonderful things that you're doing uh, in, in the veterinary oncology world. So I, I am so slap happy to have you uh, here on uh, Fuzzy Butts and Friends. So welcome. Um, so let's jump right into it. Um, in reading your bio uh, and part of the, being so fascinated with the background. So tell me, was it genetics or passion that got you into veterinary medicine? I, I think genetics got me into veterinary medicine and passion got me into oncology. Um, so my father's stepfather was an old school veterinarian um, that went to veterinary school in, er, he graduated in 1916 from a school that no longer exists. And those were, those schools were two-year schools to, to teach people to take care of animals at a, a much different you know, the animals they took care of were horses and cows and, and uh, swine and, and sheep. Um, and then my father was a, a mixed animal practitioner. And then, of course, I've honed it down further and only take care of cats and dogs. I got interested in the oncology world when I was in uh, as an undergraduate and I took a seminar on um molecular biology. And molecular biology is, is the study of DNA and how it works. And of course, some people will, will coin the phrase cancer is your genetic disease. Genetic meaning not that it's necessarily inherited, although there are inherited risks and there are some inherited cancers, but it, it, genetic meaning that in, it affects the DNA in your cells because the DNA goes crazy, doesn't behave itself and turns into a tumor. And so molecular biology is where I got my interest in oncology. Um, and that's why I say, so it, it's the passion comes, uh, comes from the passion led to my interest in oncology. And then all through veterinary school, every time there was an option to write a paper or do a project, I always chose an oncology topic for that paper or project because of my interest in cancer. So that's how I kind of got where I am now. You know, 
what fascinates me, you talk about your writing, and I think that's another thing that that fascinates me about you is, is your prodigious um, and prolific in your publications and all of the other things as well. But it seems to be the common theme is that you love two things. You love writing and research. And those are two things that I do almost nearly all of my time um, away from this podcast. Although, uh, unlike you, I don't seem to publish really any, any of my writing. So, um, so tell me about some of that. You do so many things. Tell us about some of those things. Well, I write on, on two different levels. And, and I don't know that I would have ever predicted that I would spend as much time writing as I currently do. I, I thought I was going to take care of sick animals. A and I, I do a lot of that, but there are two, two aspects of writing. So one is the scientific writing where we write about treatments that we give to animals to help other veterinarians treat patients better. Um, we write about um, diagnoses that we make to help other veterinarians treat patients better. And, and that's part of the Animal Medical Center's mission is to do clinical research, which clinical research means we study those animals who are already sick and try and draw conclusions from diagnoses, treatments, um, investigations into those those animals. And so that's clinical research, as opposed to laboratory research, which is cells in dishes and zebra fish in tanks and, and all that sort of research, which is not the kind of thing that AMC does. And then the other side of my writing is that I've written the blog for the Animal Medical Center for, I, I think, a decade now. And so there's the last time I counted, there were 600 of them. And we wrote a blog post called the 600th blog post and talked about the popular blog posts and realized that a lot of those blog posts were actually pain points for owners. So two things that fit in with the fuzzy butt and friends um, theme would be um, lipomas. So a lipoma for the listeners who are not familiar is a benign fatty tumor. Uh, lots of dogs have them. Do any of your dogs have them? Had them? Uh, yes, lipomas? Yes. Right. We just actually diagnosed two that were um, basically just masses on, in uh, one of my kids, Indiana's side. Yeah. Goodness, and so were... they're, they're really, really common. But the problem is that they fake you out because sometimes you think it's a fatty tumor and then it's not. And so that's always a conundrum for pet owners is what to do about those fatty tumors. And it's clearly a pain point for pet owners because that is one of my most often viewed blogs is, is the fatty tumor blog. Another blog that was really, a couple of blogs that were popular were um, a blog on amputation. And of course, that's very germane to the fuzzy butt message. And because dogs with bone cancer, osteosarcoma often need a leg amputated to remove the tumor and also control their pain. That's, that's an important thing to keep in mind is that bone tumors are painful and that amputation, although I cringe when I have to recommend it and the pet owner does more than cringe when I'm recommending it, but ultimately it makes the pet not painful and it gets rid of the tumor. So it has, it has, there's good things about that procedure that people don't like, but that was a pain point for people. They do not like legs removed. And another one, which is a surprise was a tail amputation blog. And I would say probably the number one reason for, for tail amputations in, in dogs will be the dog runs out the door, the door that slams on the tail and either fractures the tail or ruptures the blood supply. And then the tip of the tail kind of dies because it doesn't have a blood supply anymore. And you can't, can't make a new blood supply. And if you think about a dog's tail, it's really hard to like splint a dog's tail because it's going to wag that splint off in two seconds. So a fractured tail is painful and often the tail has to be shortened to get rid of the fracture. And again, no one likes to remove a, a tail in a dog. And so that was another really, that was a more surprising popular blog out of that list, because I think it's a pain point for people. They don't 
they don't like have to re remove the dog's tail, but sometimes it just has to happen. So writing blogs, which they are, they, those are directed not at veterinarians. The blogs are directed at pet parents, just like Fuzzy Butt Podcast is. And so you and I um, have that in common. And it's both of us spend a lot of time communicating with pet families. I mostly do it in writing, although I do do it once a month on, on my, uh, my podcast, which is Ask the Vet on Sirius XM. Excellent. I, I want to go back to something that's a particular area of interest, interest to me, and it's, it's, it's really a, a part of my mission going forward. And it's a bit of a, a badger's den, not a bunny trail, it's a badger's den. And I, don't, I won't let us get down too far down into it because it is controversial. So I recently had uh, lost a, 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 my boy, Hudson, to uh, metastatic uh, mast cell um, uh, cancer. And it happened very fast. And because he was having um, blood pressure issues, respiratory issues, he was just basically his... This whole system was kind of collapsing. We couldn't we couldn't moderate the pain. There was nothing we could do to, to moderate the pain at all. And unfortunately, in most of the states in this country, I think everyone I know of is that veterinarians can't talk and, and don't talk about the uh, the potential of in the use of cannabis THC um, and 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 um, and in its other variant uh, Delta Eight in, in dogs and. Um, the reason why I bring it up is because New York State, where you're based out of, recently legalized both medical and and um, and recreational, I think. So my question to you, um, if you don't know the answers, that, that's cool, because I'm, I'm curious, and, I, and this is going to be a to topic I'm taking, I'm going to carry forward, is um, are vets now in New York State, are they able to talk about cannabis uh, for pain manage management and our uh, canine companions, do you know? So that question is answers on multiple levels. So one is, I think California is the state with the worst gag rule. I think there's no point in me talking about it because I can't prescribe it. Um, so, so that's the medical marijuana law in New York state applies to people and does not apply to animals. So that's, that's, that's different. I, I could talk about it, but I can't prescribe it. So we got to talk about something else. Right. So, Second thing is that if you go on the FDA's website, they a couple years ago now published a um, kind of a white paper where what they did was they ordered a bunch of CBD products, THC, but what they ordered it off the internet. And then they asked the question in a research lab, how much of the stuff that the client is paying for is really in this bottle that they just bought on the internet? And the answer was often not much. And the problem is that because they are not approved drugs, except in a couple of really rare situations. If they're not approved drugs, the FDA doesn't regulate them. If the FDA doesn't regulate them, then no one's holding the feet to the fire of the company manufacturing these products. And therefore they can put nothing in them and sell them as CBD, THC oil, ointment, whatever. And there's no regulation. So it there, there aren't products that are reliable out there because you, you how products become reliable is the government has a regulation and they don't have a regulation. Next level of conversation is there's very limited information about what the dose is in dogs. And the because THC and its derivatives are not um, are highly regulated by the government. And if you want to research and study them, there's a bunch of hoops to jump through. Now, because of the interest in it, I think the hoops are, are maybe down a little from where they were five years ago. And so there are bits of, of research coming out. So far, I haven't seen anything that is um, really showing that, that these drugs are making a difference. There was one where they looked at uh, I don't remember what product, but they looked at one of these marijuana derivatives for seizures in dogs and were unable to show that it helped. And um, so, so there's, there's scraps of information starting to come out. Then if you ask an emergency room veterinarian, they would say, oh my God, 
you people have to be careful about these products with their pets because dogs have died from getting into your stash of of THC butter or your marijuana gummies or whatever it is because dogs love to eat stuff that you don't want them to and so these like the gummies are sweet and the dogs get them out of the drawer the cabinet whatever in the kitchen and then they end up in our ER I bet we have three cases a week of of dogs that have gotten into um, THC edibles or somebody's stash um, that land them in our ER Uh, so it it and so we know it can be toxic and we don't know what the right dose is because there's really limited research. So it's not that I'm gagged. It's I don't have that. A, I don't have that much to talk about. And even if I had something to talk about, it, I can't prescribe it. So it, 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 it's exactly. kind of a non-discussion discussion. Right. No, actually, you had everything that I wanted you to say. You, you said perfectly. Excellent. Those are all great points. And I want to get I want to explore every single one of those points to the extent that I can on fuzzy butts and friends, um, because when you do have, when pain management is a consideration, you know, cannabis THC should be looked at, but there aren't any studies. And my, my, I guess my, my long range vision is potentially maybe getting some of those um, valid studies, peer uh, reviewed studies done, at least in, in the canine model um, to the extent that I can. So you did great. Thank you. I know it was, I kind of threw that out of the, out of the out of the ballpark but um, can you tell I, i've been asked that question before i were you I, <laughs> that, that, that's the funny thing is you answered it so expertly i'm like good god she's clearly like this she had it in her left pocket ready to go and just for the listeners out there this was not on my list of questions luke was going to ask me yeah my uh, did, you my, know my, he my, slipped that one in and i did i really didn't mean to my apologies but it's on my mind and and i think it is an important and i get asked so much unfortunately and I, this is this is relevant I had somebody very, very near and dear to puppy up our foundation um, that's been following our travels for for I think the first first walk I think, and she at least uh, recently had an interim um, uh, uh, a cancer dog, um, and uh, you know they were just trying to do anything to to help manage the pain, and uh, she asked me all of those questions, and I gave her all of the answers that you gave. Is that even if there is a product out on the market that I mean, they're just there, you can't really trust anything on the market out there, period. So it's it's the, the start of a very, very complex conversation. And I'm glad you've been asked that because I'm going to be asked that. We're going to ask those questions. And this is the good episode to start that dialogue. Thank you. But again, uh, I, I just want to say <laughs> one other thing that I, I didn't mention was I talked about edibles because most of the time, dogs have end up in our ER because they ate something because dogs are indiscriminate eaters. I, I saw a dog this morning and the concern was it had diarrhea because it was eating goose poop. So, but the other thing is if somebody is smoking and the dog is in the room, dogs can become ill from inhaling. And so if, if you're, you know, because recreational marijuana is legal, please remember to leave your dog outside the room for the party because you can make your dog sick by it, your dog breathing the smoke. And remember that smoke settles down. And where is your dog in your house? Usually it is on the floor, which is where all that smoke is going to settle. So Please, since since we don't want to have to see your dog in our ER or anyone else's, you know, anyone else wants to see your dog, um, be sure that they are not part of the part party. Yeah, I feel feel the same way about cigarette smoke. Um, I, I'm a former cigarette smoker. Actually, I stopped smoking cigarettes when after I lost my my first dog, Malcolm, to cancer. That's a little bit of history there. Uh, but I never smoked around him cigarette. I never smoked around him at all because I felt just, you know, we didn't know the data wasn't out there about secondhand smoke. And I just didn't want that particulate air anywhere around him. And yet he still got bone cancer. And so I always, you know, you carry that guilt, you know, everything that I did wrong, you know, when my dog gets cancer, my loved one gets cancer, you carry, you carry that on burden with you at all times. And that's on my list is that, I didn't smoke around him, but I had it on my, you know, it's just, it's on everything. So that's also a great point that you made. These are all great points. Excellent. Well, I think one other thing to remember is that 
we worry about secondhand smoke for the human family members who are breathing that air and for the dog dog family member who's breathing that air. But also keep in mind that that smoke gets on your dog's fur. And how does your dog clean that fur? It licks and ingests whatever smoke particulate matter settles on their fur. So that because of how dogs are, dogs have got an extra whammy, not just breathing the smoke in, but ingesting that particulate matter that settles on their coat. You take your clothes off, they go to the laundry, you take a shower, you don't clean yourself by licking yourself, or at least I hope you don't. But dogs will ingest those products because of how they uh, clean themselves. And so that that makes smoking around your dog extra bad um, than maybe even smoking around your kids. Yeah, that's again, great point. I'm by no means an expert at all in THC or cannabis, but that's why we want to start the conversation and learn as much as we can. But what I am sort of not an expert in, but what I what I'm driving at the bigger question that I'm getting at um, and is cancer and dogs and pain management because I've lost three dogs to, to cancer and every pain it has been a part of it. Um, bone cancer was my first one. You mentioned pain in, in bone cancer. That was my first one. Uh, uh, nasal adenocarcinoma was the second one. And the most recent one, Hudson, uh, uh, was uh, mast cell. Um, that one happened so so quickly. I didn't really have uh, the, the, the amount of time to, to really deal with pain management um, to that extent. But what I where I'm interested is is how that um, how that is part of this great, what I think this great giant ecosphere of canine cancer. Um, it's a part of it. So let's get to that. And I think because you, um, and you have such a great rich history, three generations of veterinarians, it's so interesting and unique. So I just want to ask you, and you've been doing this, you write so much, you've seen so much. I just want to ask you, you and, 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 and as part of your history, um, Tell us about how you see cancer in dogs and how that has changed. So some things have changed and some things haven't. So I would say that when I was a young veterinarian, the, the tumor I hated the most was mast cell tumor because we didn't have very much we could do for that disease. Some steroids, um, remove it with surgery. Then we started getting radiation and that really seemed to help a lot. And so I would say that the treatment of mast cell tumor has really progressed dramatically over the course of my career. And and for the, absolutely for the good. So now we can say that if your dog has a grade one mast cell tumor and the surgeons are able to completely remove it, your dog probably is fixed from that tumor. Now, once you have one mast cell tumor, you're at risk for more. So that doesn't mean that you don't have to patrol your dog for new lumps and have those lumps tested and have your veterinarian send that test to the lab. But that mass, that grade one mast cell tumor is probably not going to be the cause of your dog's demise and is not likely to come back or spread. And then we know that the grade three mast cell tumors are bad players. And I'm thinking maybe that's what Luke just got done dealing with was a, a, a bad player grade three mast cell tumor. Those things oftentimes have spread before you even find this little red pimple on your dog of a mast cell tumor. And sometimes the lymph node that the tumor is spread to is even bigger than the original tumor. It, these grade three mast cell tumors are just bad actors. Well, let's then, just, I'm sorry, I'm yeah. sorry. I, I, didn't want to, I want, wanted to stop you right there because that's, that's just a great entree into this discussion because Hudson um, should be the poster child for what you're talking about, the advancement in, in veterinary medicine, because we think I don't have, I have to look back and know exactly, he was a 10 year survivor of mast cell cancer. So, and he, he we had, I, I don't know the numbers, I think it was probably close to 10, maybe a little bit more mast cell tumors that we removed over a 10 year period. And they were all grade two. Um, they were all, all low, low mitotic index as well. So for me, speaks exactly what you what you're saying is that 
mast cell, um, the advance in, in treatment um, and outcome, more importantly, in mast cell cancer and veterinary medicine is, is wonderful. So thank you guys for well, that. And I, I think that the, the, the ability to differentiate mast cell tumor into th different types and say to people, you don't need your dog had surgery that's all the treatment your dog needs and then to say to the the people who have a grade three mast cell tumor we need to pull out all the stops on this dog because this is this is not a good tumor and then the grade twos are somewhere in the middle of that mix and being able to know that information and then apply the drugs that we have to those dogs who really need it and not treat every dog with a mast cell tumor with chemo that it doesn't really need. You know, I like giving chemo, but I'd rather your dog didn't need it, but I also need to know whose dog really needs it so that I can give it. And I think we're, we're really getting there with, with canine mast cell tumors. I, I would say for bone cancer, since you brought it up, I, I don't know that we're, we're making, we've made great strides. I think those dogs still, um, amputation and uh, for pain control and removing tumor, but those dogs still very tragically all pretty much die of a bone tumor that spreads elsewhere in the body and makes the dog really sick. That's one we haven't made a big dent in, in over the course of, of my career. Um, so definite advances and definite what, what non about, advances. Um, pardon me. Um, what do sometimes if if you, if you move ahead and I don't stop, I tend to forget, especially when I write it down. So my apologies when I do that. Um, but but uh, what about let's talk about some of the new ones that we're seeing and this information. I know I, you I know as well as you do that we're just suffering from a lack of overall data, good data, um, cancer specific, breed specific data is changing a little bit. Uh, but we're still we still lack good good quality data out there. But what oh, about, I think oh, oh. the other thing to add to your list of what we lack is we need big data. We don't need yeah, forty right. dogs with a tumor. We need four hundred right. dogs or four thousand dogs with a tumor. Yep, I talk to Phil Bergman about this all the time. That he, I'm of the gospel of data, but but so we don't have a lot. But but what? Uh, but but I like let's take na nasal adenocarcinoma. Um, the second dog I lost to cancer, Murphy, and amongst the Great Pyrenees community, and I'm in some other some other groups, and I'm seeing more and more people talk about nasal cancer. So, so we know. So you're talking about how treatment has changed over the years. What about are we are we seeing up at AMC in the New York State area? Um, are you seeing new types of cancers and breeds? How is cancer itself its manifest its manifestation? changing in, in, in canines, as you can. Well, some of what changes is, so I don't know that we're seeing more nasal cancer. Now, maybe we've always seen a lot because we know that dogs in urban areas are more common to have nasal cancer, probably because of environmental pollutants. Uh, and then dogs with long noses, so dolicocephalic dogs. So think collie. Um, think greyhound. So dogs with long noses are more likely to have nasal cancer than the uh, newly popular French bulldog, which is exploding in the in the New York City area. Everybody's got a Frenchie now. So some of the the changes in cancer that we see are related to breed popularity, right? Because if you have a dog, the golden retriever is the poster child for that. Golden retrievers have a propensity to hemangiosarcomas of the spleen, lymphoma, and um, those are probably, and a little bit mast cell tumor. So you see lots of golden retrievers, you're going to see lots of that disease. You see lots of Frenchies, which we are seeing now, and then you're going to see mast cell tumors because the little squish face dogs are prone to mast cell tumors. So breed and frequency of disease travel together because of these breed predilections for certain tumors. I also suspect that there are differences um, internationally. I suspect that what people see in Western Europe are different tumors than, than what we see here a little bit, driven in part by the gene pool of the dogs in in Europe. So 
breed and disease go a little bit hand in hand. Yes, you're about to make a perfect segue to the next question I have. But before you do, I always ask the veterinary oncologists that I talk with, because you're speaking to the question I get from pet parents all the time on my travels. And that is, is it genetic or environmental? And the answer, as you know, is yes. You know, it's, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So Luke has answered his own question perfectly. Yes, but but I it, with the interesting thing that it really fascinates me because I always ask everyone I meet, well, what do you what percentage do you think is it eighty percent genetic, twenty percent environmental? Um, what do you think? So what 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 are your thoughts if you were able to simplistically look at it like that? Whoa, that that's so. I think these tumors that are rare. Um, adrenal tumors, nasal tumors are not very common. Those tumors are probably more bad luck than either. You know, you have a, a cell that the DNA gets a mutation and it goes crazy. Um, it, and so those, those are probably the bad luck tumors in there. It, the Say, for example, mammary carcinoma. Now there's, there's clearly some role of environment in the development of those because spayed dogs just get way fewer mammary tumors than intact dogs do. And here's an example of where international is different. So in South America and in Western Europe, they don't, spaying is not a routine procedure like it is here in the United States. And so those veterinary oncologists in Europe and South America see a ton more mammary cancer in dogs than we do in the US. And so that is an environment, you would say, well, is it environmental? Well, it's kind of the dog's internal environment that probably it's hormonal environment that plays a role, but it's not necessarily genetics that plays a role because it's kind of across the board, unspayed dogs just tend to have more mammary tumors. So I, I'm i going to hedge and say it's mostly 50-50. There are plenty of golden retrievers that have never had lymphoma or never had uh, hemangio, right? But then we see these uh, boxers, Frenchies with mast cell tumors. And, you know, that there's clearly some role where some gene that, or genes that predispose to mast cell tumors has been drug along with the squish faced dogs that give them mast cell tumors. It's a really complicated issue because there's, there's all kinds of impacts. The, the spay and neuter thing, the gene pool US versus um, Western Europe, and then environment, all of them, all of those things roll together to, to make your dog get whatever tumor it's going to get. It, it's, it's a, that's a very tough question. Yeah, it, it is. You know, it's interesting. I talk to breeders as well, or I have on my travels and uh, you know, some of them say, well, we've done a great job in eliminating the cancer genes that are specific to this breed, whether it's uh, uh, bladder cancer with Westies or whatever, the ones that you listed before, we've done a great job of really eliminating the cancers out of the bloodline. And my response is, that's fantastic. I want, I, I think it's wonderful. We need more of that, lots of that. And yet, and yet the environment's going to put it back in there at some point down the line. That's just the way it's going to work. Because you said at the very beginning, cancer really is a disease of the DNA. It's, it's internally, it's a malfunction. It's an error and stuff and it happens um, um, over time, naturally, anyway, it occurs natu spontaneously. It occurs spontaneously anyway, but let's segue into something. The next thing that I found was so fascinating, um, about your bio that I, that I, that I read and you've touched on it already is you're part of an organization called WSAVA and talk about that. And more importantly, you've already touched on it, but let's talk about about the global canine cancer community versus um, the U.S. So the the WASAVA is how that organization um, says their acronym, which stands for the World Small Animal Veterinary Association, and I'm along to the oncology working group. Um, it's a, a committee under WASAVA, and WASAVA has a lot of committees that work to improve animal health globally, and so. Uh, 
the we call ourselves wow the wasaba oncology working group and so wow's mission is to help to level the playing field for oncologists globally there's a lack of of resources um you know the us has tons of resources not enough resources but compared to some other countries we have a lot of resources for managing pets with cancer and so we're trying to provide veterinarians who um uh, want to know more about cancer in pets with the resources to do so. So we we're a group that's been in existence barely a year. Uh, well, not quite a year. I think it'll be a year in May or June. And so we've kind of attacked um, leveling the playing field a number of ways. So the first thing we did was we created a, well, the Wasaba people created us a web page which has all kinds of resources on it about pet cancer. And that web page is open to anyone. Um, it's more tilted towards veterinarians, but pet parents are going to find some things they like on that website as well. And so if you just um, type in WSAVA.org and look under committees, it, it'll take you to the oncology working group. And you can click on whatever you want. So we, we collected some resources. And then one of our first projects was to create an oncology glossary. And this glossary is written at a high level. I 100% I agree. But it was trying to translate oncology doctor talk to the level of what a pet parent whose pet has cancer would want to know. And the whole document is cross-referenced. So if you're in a section that's talking about chemotherapy, and then it says, but chemotherapy might be combined with radiation therapy, the radiation therapy will have a hot link and it will take you to the definition of radiation therapy. And so you can bounce around the whole document following different threads. The other thing that's great is, I don't know how far your podcast reads, but it's trend, this document has been translated into, I think, a dozen languages by WOW members and by WOW, you know, WOW member employees and things. So we've got it in Chinese and we've got it in Catalan and we've got it in Portuguese and we've got it in, I think there's a Japanese version. So it's available for, for lots of people to look at and download with some very to the point illustrations as well. Um, then we're also working with various journal, uh, scientific journals to provide us access to their oncology articles free, because many of these exist behind paywalls. And in progress, we have a oncology surgery checklist. When you go into an operating room, you want to be sure that every step is taken to make sure a pet in the OR is getting everything is being done to keep that pet safe, to make sure that the biopsy gets submitted appropriately. And so the WOW group has written an oncology surgery checklist, and it's being piloted right now at some various uh, veterinary hospitals to get feedback. And then once we think we've got that list squared away, we'll publicize it on our website in order to help make oncology service safer oncology surgery safer at all veterinary hospitals. Any veterinarian will be able to download this and use it in their operating room. So we're, we're trying to offer things that, that will make oncology more accessible and better quality uh, to, to pet patients all over the world. It's a wonderful resor resource. Um, I know the Puppy Up Foundation shares, shares some, if not all of it. Um, as far as our podcast reach, not very far right now, but it will, I assure you. And you're getting in, you're getting in early and you're getting in cheap. You're, you're going to be probably, <laughs> you're going to be probably one of the first 10. So, um, we'll give you somewhere to something to hang some somewhere one day. Um, you, you know, that's, uh, those are wonderful resources and I'm sure we'll put them in the show notes, all the links in the show notes. Um, but what I also want to talk about, so it's a great organization. It's wonderful what they do. What they do. Um, I kind of want to talk that in more of a comparison to the U.S. here in a bit. But give us an idea, um, just generally, you, you've said some, a few specifics. What is What does cancer look like worldwide compared to the United States? So it, it 
depends on where you are. Um, this oncology working group has members that are Dutch, Ukrainian, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian. Oh, but the Italian works in Hong Kong. And we've got a South American representative who bounces between Mexico and Argentina. And then uh, we have a British member and me. And um, so it depends, like I said, it depends on where you are, what the level of care is. So the people in Europe know a ton about mammary cancer. And I had a question the other day, so I emailed one of, one of my colleagues on the committee because I knew that they would know the answer to my question because they see more of that than we do. And so it, they have a high level of, of oncology care in Western Europe, but there's drug availability issues. So all the drugs we can get in the US are not necessarily available in Europe. And some of the drugs that we have, some of our animal or dog specific chemotherapy drugs are not available worldwide either. And so that's a challenge is drug availability worldwide limits what veterinarians can do because they can't get drugs that we have here. Um, so, so that's one of the things. However, Western Europe is quite advanced in oncology treatment. The um, Latin American people are very interested in oncology. They're, they're a bit behind. And I think Hong Kong has a lot of veterinary specialists and support from uh, people in the US um, who work there to make oncology better in those countries. So I would say that I don't know very much about oncology, say in China uh, or in Russia, but, um, Oh, and then we also have a wonderful Polish student member on our um, oncology committee, and they don't have specialization in Poland like we do in the U.S., and so she is thinking about pursuing oncology um, through getting a Ph.D. So not all countries have specialists that are recognized. That's a, a global difference. Um, Europe does. Uh, Japan has oncology specialists. Uh, there's a, mm, what is it called? The, the Asian College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, and there's the European College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. And those groups are both modeled after the US with oncology specialists. So oncology is spreading. It's spreading, but slow. Very slow. Um, I'm not an incremental, incremental dude. Um, um, I'm a very impatient by, by nature and I think it move very, very fast. So, um, it's been in my existence, unfortunately, but it is a reality, especially when you're talking about scientific research, but you brought it up about how some countries are behind America, but the reality is, well, what do you think? I talk, I, there's another question, um, I, I throw out there and ask all the oncologists I talk to, if you were, uh, if you were uh, to, to say America was. Would you say America's, or at least in terms of American, our veterinary oncology is 10 years behind um, US oncology, 20 years? How far behind is veterinary oncology compared to um, US? Oncology? I think some places it, it is as good. Um, wow, even in terms of treatments? Yeah, it, like. Western Europe is is at the level of the U.S. or maybe a smidge in some countries below. Um, I would say that the Japanese have a very active oncology um, community there, and I think the Japanese are really very good at um, laboratory science related to oncology. They do a lot of interesting things there. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I must have misspoke. My apologies. My, my question was um, in the U.S., focusing entirely on the U.S., only yeah. on the U.S., if we were to compare the U.S. veterinary oncology in terms of diagnostics and treatments and, and compare that to U.S., human oncology. Oh, okay. All right. So I how, how far completely behind blew is. that answer. Yeah, well, um, I'm sure I, I'm sure I messed that up. The de default is me. I screwed it up, I'm sure. So we're we're goodly behind. Uh, I don't know. I can put a timeline on it. But what do we not have? We only have three approved drugs 
I think it's three for treating dog cancer. Um, every other drug I use to treat cancer is some drug I've stolen from human medicine. Now that human medicine is going towards um, personalized medicine, where you look at the DNA of the tumor and then treat based on the DNA changes, we have, it, it's in its infancy. It's starting, but we're not there yet. And a lot of the therapies for cancer are now immunotherapies and you, they're advertised on TV all the time. You know them because you've heard the commercial a million times. And those immune therapies depend on specific targets in the cancer. Well, dogs don't have the same target as people do. So then those immune therapies cannot be adapted to our canine patients like we used to adapt doxorubicin from, from human oncology. We just gave it to dogs. And so personalized medicine has set us back in veterinary oncology in terms of keeping up with the Joneses, uh, our colleagues, you know, up the street at Memorial Sloan Kettering because of, of immunotherapy that just doesn't work in dogs. Case in point, uh, rituxan. Rituxan is a monoclonal antibody that has revolutionized the treatment of lymphoma in people and taken it from a fatal disease to a disease that has a decent chance of getting cured. But rituxan although it binds to cancerous lymphocytes, does not bind to dog lymphocytes. So we just cannot order up some rituxan and give it to our dog patients with lymphoma because guess what? It won't work. So we, we, were, we were catching up for a while and now they've sprinted ahead because of the types of treatments that are being prioritized. That'd be one. And then two, we're behind in terms of diagnostics, diagnostic testing. And then three, I'll throw it back to you on this one. And that is um, data. We don't have data. Now, the, the reason that we are able to parse mast cell tumors to the degree that we can today is because there is actually a lot of data out there. But for other tumors, there isn't a lot of data or the data sets are very small. And so we need big data in order to answer a lot of questions. And there's no NIH for the dog world. Yes. Um, let's go about specifically to targets. That's one I, I really wanted to talk, talk to you specifically about because you're doing some very interesting stuff in immunotherapy because that's really the mother load, the, 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 the golden standard of, of treatment, I guess, in oncology. Um, and um, I went to the, I think it was the IOC, um, uh, CSU, Colorado State University put it on, in DC where they brought together, it was a, the theme was comparative oncology, translational oncology, and they brought together um, all the big guns in the veterinary oncology world, some of them um, um, big guns in the veterinary oncology world. And some of the, the people, there were some um, human oncologists and some, some, some representatives, some actually top scientists from big pharma. And uh, really was a stellar uh, start studded uh, uh, event. And it was a great event. But um, having sit, sat through several days of it, what fascinated me the most is they allowed the, everyone to get up and talk about what was the value of the entire session and what was the what did they get out of it? And what is the value proposition? Right. Why? Why, why would big pharma? You, you just said it. We're, we're we're X number of years behind. Um, in treatment and diagnostics. So why don't we have more than three um, drugs that are FDA approved? Well, well, money is the answer, deep pockets. That's one of the answer, I'm sorry. It's, it's one of the many, it's a very complicated, complex uh, uh, formula, uh, but money is one of them. And Big Pharma was speaking specifically to that. The question was asked, how do we get Big Pharma to, to put more money into these translational comparative oncology trials the Puppy Up Foundation has, has funded a dozen or so of them, and you know, we're always looking to partner and, and syndicate those deals. So why isn't there more money? And it was interesting, and to hear the, the, what the response to that was, and it was the answer was, you know, the value proposition is the, the canine model may save us some time and money in the, the, the discovery and development cycle, that multi-year, you know, now plus a billion dollar cycle, 
that, that may be true. There may be the value proposition there, but what we really want from the, the veterinary world is we want, we want valid dated targets. That's what we want. Um, and so it's, it's interesting that that, that that is such a big need and that's how pharma sees it in terms of, because you're right, um, that is this personalized, that is the, the crux of personalized medicine, right? Yeah. Um, and those, although you can't really call it, I think Kana, Dr. Kana said, we can't really call it personalized medicine in dogs. It has to be something else. Because dogs are not persons. Is that his argument? Yeah, we're, we're definitely not going. No, 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 it's not his. No, no, I'm sorry. No, no, it wasn't Dr. Chan's. Uh, it wasn't his uh, argument at all. Um, I think it's an NIH, one of the regulatory Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, they, yeah regulatory has words right. you can and can't use. Yeah. Right, right. But essentially, as you know, it is it is uh, pharmacogenetics, it's, uh, it's genomics, it is targeted therapeutics. So we're, that, that's a big, big need. And I would love to nerd out with you more on that, but we're, we're, we're running a little long and I still wanted to co cover a, a number of, of other things because you really are making the case uh, of where I wanted to go and just touch on just briefly in that we're so far, veterinary oncology in the United States is so far behind human oncology for the complex myriad of, of reasons that I've come to learn in the 14 years that I've been studying this um, and speaking to people about this. Um, it's wonderful what Wasava is, is doing and you're doing and especially learning about because there is so much that you can learn globally that you can bring back to the state. So the, not, the sharing the knowledge is, is a two way street, I would, I, I imagine. Um, but, you know, there is st still so much work um, uh, that needs to be done. And one of the notes that I made here, I, I just realized that was the adoption of the word comparative on oncology. Um, and uh, in, in the human scientific community. Um, so we still have so much much work to do in, in the, human, uh, the, the veterinary oncology community. So what are, this, what are some of the challenges that you see within the community? What can we do? How can pet parents help out? Because, because we're, we're really, if you think the, 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 I think the number we're using now, it varies uh, depending on who's, my apologies, I haven't turned out all of my, all, all my notifications. We're, I think we're using 6 million new cases of cancer in dogs a year. So, so that's a lot. So pet parents obviously are the biggest stakeholder in this. So, so if you look at all the challenges that you see and, um, and, 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 and especially as it pertains to the veterinary oncology community, what can pet parents do a better job of in engaging the, the veterinary oncology community? What can we do on our end? Well, I, I I have a, a laundry list of unrelated topics. So one would be, do not ignore masses. You know, it, it, seek the opinion of a veterinarian when your pet has a mass and deal with it because, and, and that's a, on a one pet level. Pet parents take the best care of their pet. If the pet has a lump, have someone test it, have someone send it to the lab and then do something about it masses don't get ever get smaller or they hardly ever get smaller on their own. They only ever get bigger. So you may as well do something about it while it's small. I think that pet parents who, who have a diagnosis of a malignancy in their devastation and upset with that um, need to see if there is an oncologist closest to them. And I, I know there are pockets in the United States where there just are no oncologists anywhere near anything. And that, that's, that's a challenge right there is there's not enough oncologists to treat every pet that has cancer. The, the other thing to do is, is look for clinical trials, because if there is a clinical trial that you can get to and your pet, pet qualifies for, Think very hard about um, being philanthropic. Not the word. I never can think of this word. Um, the word, you know, giving back to society. It, if if you and your pet can enroll in this study, this is going to help veterinarians get more information, which is then going to help more pets in the future. And the AVMA has a um, clinical trials database. Any veterinarian that's running a clinical trial for any disease, it does not have to be cancer, but there are cancer diseases in this database. And I can't remember the name of the database, but it's something like 
it's not called clinical trials. I'll, I'll look it up when we get offline and I'll send it to Luke and then it can go in his transcript of the show. But that's a good resource because you can search by diagnosis. So your pet has a hemangiosarcoma, you can put hemangiosarcoma in the search bar and all the trials that are registered in this database will come up. So think about entering your pet in a clinical trial, either by looking for one, asking your veterinarian, calling the closest specialty hospital and see if they know about one because that helps everybody. Um, Absolutely. Data sharing goes both ways and on, 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 on our end and certainly on the Puppy Up Foundation it as well is that we're, we're constantly saying, even if you know it's cancer, even if you, you think it's cancer, you know, 80, 90% chance that it's cancer and getting that additional and getting the diagnosis, getting the, a positive diagnosis or confirmation doesn't change your treatment plan, right? Let's just say that you can't afford it. You can only do palliative. You're hundred percent sure of that. And so you're, and so as a pet parent, you think, well, there's just no, no use in getting it, confirming it. And so what I always tell pet parents is absolutely a reason for doing it. And if you can't afford it, you know, it's not really that much, not that expensive, but at least you're giving that data is important. So it is important for pet parents to know if you can afford to get that, um, that, that confirmation, whether it's through your general, um, your GP, your, your, your family veterinarian um, with just a biopsy, and that's the confirmation, that's still important data that, that, that's important um, that we need. Um, but and, and it also, sure. even if a client can't do a big fancy oncology treatment for their pet, we can, we meaning veterinarians can still manage your pet better if they know what the tumor is, because then they know how it's likely to behave, what it's likely to do. And then you can target what you're going to palliate that animal with better. A- absolutely. Um, it's like, I'm talking to myself with you. It's <laughs> spooky. Um, uh, it, 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 that's a, that's, that's another thing that I, that I, I, I share with, with pet parents as well, is that you, you need the data. We need the data, but you also, I'm a big proponent in getting the, um, the consultation with a board certified oncologist. Um, to me, that's an important part of the process. And that's a segue into the other thing that I wanted to discuss with you, which you touched on briefly, is the number of available oncologists out there. Um, uh, we're going to try to get someone with ACVIM on to discuss that. Um, uh, the extent that I understand it, it was a modeling problem uh, a while ago, and so we've never caught it because there are some states out there right next to Memphis is Arkansas. There are zero board-certified oncologists. Uh, uh, I think Nebraska is still one of them. Um, so we had recently, uh, Rachel Venable on, and she's doing the tele consulting, which is essentially telemedicine, um, to help with the stop gap, you know, so if you, if you think you, you have a dog with cancer, you go in and you talk to the GP and your GP, and then you do a biopsy and then a teleconsultation is with a board certified, um, um oncologist. So uh, that's a big passion um, area of interest of, of mine, but but you're right. That- I, oh, I have friends in Australia that are board certified oncologists and they, they, you know, Australia is a really big country. The, the way that maps make it look, it doesn't look that big, it's big. Australia is really big. Getting from here to there in Australia, it takes a long time. And th- there are not a lot of oncologists in Australia And these friends of mine have made a business of providing phone consults to people to help them manage on to help the GPs manage oncology patients better. And so I think that, you know, there's there's good things that have come out of the pandemic. And I think um, one of them is you know, that we're all much more familiar with video conferencing. If you and I were doing this podcast recording two, three years ago, we would have been talking on the telephone. We would have not been recording this over Zoom. And so that's going to make people more accepting of video conferences to try and manage pets 
when the specialist that you need is remote and not, you know, not within driving distance um, for your patients. So I, I think that um, that this is going to be something good that's going to come out of the pandemic is that we're going to be more flexible about managing oncology patients. And I think that will be good for pets everywhere. A absolutely. Um, interestingly enough, is that I tried to do something similar to this after I lost my second dog, Murphy, to cancer and adopted my fourth fuzzy butt, Indiana. And I had a little show called Raising, Indi in Raising Indiana. And that was back in 2011. And the technology back then was so bad. It essentially was using some type of technology to record the co phone conversation. And then it was so horrible. It was so bad. bad. So um, I didn't have the right partner in it and I wasn't in the right place and the technology really really was awful so I just like okay we'll just table that and and now it's so much easier and technology you're right is going to solve a lot of that um, because I, I do understand that it's a very complicated problem and it's just hard getting uh, attracting some um, uh, board certified veterinary oncologists to certain areas some areas are just a little more lucrative than others um, so well, it, it's it's not I don't think it's as much about lucrative as it is about, you know, when, when you're someone who has a career that can consume you uh, and probably shouldn't, but you know, you're really busy. You want to be close to family because you need mom to take care of the kids while you're working, or you need someone to sub in when the babysitter's sick, having family close by is important. And so that's a big draw for people to go closer to home, closer to the family. Um, and, and if, if it's a not very populated state, I suspect like North Dakota, which is one of our least populated states in the nation, probably does not have an oncologist and because they don't have a population big enough to keep that oncologist busy. They probably also don't have people who've gone to veterinary school that want to be oncologists, you know, um, and so attracting someone home isn't going to happen. So it, it, it's, it's, people tend to gravitate towards their comfort zone and home and family is one of those things. And that just makes it harder to attract people because if you want to be close to mom or, you know, mom is not well and you need to help take care of her. So it's, it, it's more than just lucrative. It also is, family is really important that it yeah. is like their family like everyone else but but there is i mean you know tele, teleconsulting and telemedicine is great but the reality is we need more radiation services you know we need more surgical oncologists out there as well and that's just yes. more, more people so there's a demand supply problem um, I hope to work on the demand problem, which is getting more you know getting more dollars out there for more treatments so that pet parents can choose more than just palliative care. I mean, as you know, if we want better tools, diagnostic and therapeutic tools, we have to be able to pay for those better diagnostic and therapeutic tools. Um, so that's, it's a demand and supply problem. And so we're, we're, I like to think that they're fuzzy. I've been thinking about these for a while now and here at Fuzzy Butts and Friends, this we'll be covering and talking about all of them to work through them. So, so I just want to ask you one question. Did you have insurance for all these fuzzy butts that have had cancer? Murphy was, uh, no. Um, I mean, sorry, Malcolm was my first one. That was back in 2000. Good God, I'm going through history here. <laughs> I have to remember. He was diagnosed in 06 and he passed in, oh, I'm sorry, he was diagnosed in 04 and passed in 06. So we knew very little bit about, about bone cancer um, back then. Um, and, uh, their pet insurance was so prohibitively expensive and it covered, uh, I think it was like maybe a thousand dollars or 2000. It was negligible. I can't remember how, how many tens of thousands that was. My second one was, um, Murphy and no, I, I can't remember why <laughs> we were, it was just, we were on the walk and we were going to have a pet sponsor and uh, a pet insurance sponsor for the first walk, the Austin to Boston walk. I don't, I can't recall. And it just happened so uh, unexpectedly. He started bleeding from his snout. Um, and we took Murphy, I took Murphy to drove all night. I picked him up from Memphis, drove all night um, to Colorado State University, 
met with Steve Withrow and, uh, and it was uh, Nate and his lag and it ever just happened so fast. So with uh, Hudson, my most recent one, um, the mast cell, uh, yes, but his mast cell was it was was a um, what do you call it pre existing condition. He had had mast cell tumors oh, yeah. for ten. He yeah. had mast cell tumors for ten years, so they're like, eh, we're not going to cover that. So unfortunately, healthcare or, or uh, vet veterinarian insurance uh, was not an option. Both of my kids have insurance are covered now because I just had this conversation with Joanne Silverman, the executive director of Fetch a Cure, wonderful organization out of Richmond. Um, and we were talking about she, that's what she, that was the last word she had for pet parents is get insurance. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm with you on that. That's why I was a- asking you that because I've dealt with insurance issues all week long, but it, it makes a big difference if you can, um, uh, if, if you have insurance and, and then you can make decisions on what's right for your pet, not what you can afford. And it's heartbreaking to have to watch people make the, can you afford it type of decision? Absolutely. That's a perfect way to wrap everything up. We've got a little bit over my apologies, but we certainly want, I think that's really what the goal of fuzzy butts and friends is. We don't want heartbroken pet parents because my God, my heart's been broken three times more times because my dear friend and executive director of, of the puppy F foundation, Ginger Morgan, I think is eight. She's lost eight to cancer. Now. Um, I have so many friends four, six. So I should maybe count myself lucky three, but we don't want any more pet parents going through suffering from this horrible scourge. And that's God help us. That's what I hope I'm doing here. We're doing here with Fuzzy Butts and Friends. So, Anne, uh, uh, Dr. Hohenhaus, uh, thank you so much for being on, on um, our podcast, our show. But you, you truly are a, a friend to the, the Fuzzy Butts. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it has absolutely been great to see you once again. And I do tell Ginger, I hope she's feeling better soon. Yeah, this is an open platform. And and you have anything that you specifically want to talk to that's of interest to pet parents, that you say, this is this is a new case of cancer that I just want to get out there. Uh, you know, maybe share. We'll figure out a way to, to share podcast episodes. We'll, we'll figure out how to stay. Um, I believe in cross-pollination and collaboration. So you're welcome here. This is a, the pla- our platform is open to you here anytime. Uh, I will look forward to coming back. Look forward to it as well. All right, uh, everyone's kids. Uh, that wraps up this episode of Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Puppy up. Talk soon.